Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, you know, we've spent the last, I don't know, I guess it's like three years now, maybe even a little, actually it's been longer than three years now. It feels like a long time. Talking about many aspects of the sort of physical manufactured economy that broke or are broken in some way. Yeah. And I think it's because, I mean, obviously the pandemic exposed a lot of these fault lines with global supply chains yeah. for physical goods, primarily consumer goods, things like furniture and, and food and stuff like that. But on the other hand, there was also a lot of disruption to services. And we haven't really spoken as much about that. Right. And the other thing that's really striking with services. So actually right now we're in this period where like for the there's a lot of focus on services inflation and when is that going to come down, et cetera. But the other thing with a lot of services, particularly like very crucial services, is that to the extent that we talk about certain industries being broken or market failures, which I think was like a sort of like recurrent theme of our work, many of the what's uh, sort of broken, it seems, in the services space exist, existed long before. Like these these problems were actually very evident even prior to COVID. No, totally. There was actually a chart I was looking at just last week that showed the long-term inflation yeah. trends in the U.S. broken into sort of components. And yep. if you look at it, the highest price increases are all in services. So things like health care, yep. child care, while all the consumer goods, the durable stuff has been going down. So it's much cheaper to buy a big screen TV than previously, but it's much more expensive to have a kid and send yes. them to college and things like that. Right. And so these are like these sort of like deeper things. And so we're thinking about like, okay, what are the bottlenecks? What are the, uh, you know, the so-called market failures, et cetera, that caused this? And we look at it in the manufacturing world, but by and large, you know, TVs and refrigerators and air conditioning and cars, and they get better and better, it seems like over time. And by and large, they do get cheaper, even with the recent disruptions. But why are there parts of this economy that I think everyone considers to be crucial and sort of things related to child care, care work, elder care, which is going to become a bigger and bigger mm. crisis or issue for the economy as the baby boomer generation ages? These have been broken for people for a long time, and there's no like end in sight. There's no like, oh, it's going to finally normalize because the pre-COVID trend was so bad. Yeah, are we pivoting from goods to services? Is that what's happening? I think here? we are. I think we are doing a little pivot. All right. Well, let us. Uh, but yes, yeah, we need to talk about this more. And so I'm very excited about our guest today. We're going to be speaking with Nancy Fulbray. She is a professor emerita of economics at UMass Amherst and director of the program on gender and care work at the Political Economy Research Institute. Uh, Professor Fulbray, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Uh, thank you, I'm really looking forward to it. So let's just start with like the premise of this conversation because I, uh, you know, we discussed it as this is a care work and it, all, it, that encompasses multiple things. It feels like an area that's been broken in some sense for long before the pandemic. But I'm curious, like, A, do you accept that premise that broken is a good way to think about it? And how would you characterize the sort of, you know, what is what uh, what have we seen for years in this sector that feels wrong to people? You know, I, I kind of agree with the broken word, but I think that analyzing it completely in terms of markets, even in terms of market failure, mm. is a little bit misleading. Because what's really interesting about care provision is it involves a lot of paid work, but also a lot of unpaid work and also a lot of government provision. And it's the way that all of those um, sources of provisioning interact, I think, that give it some uh, very particular characteristics. And in, in addition to the kind of characteristics of services in general that make it different from manufacturing. Well, on that note, maybe talk to us about the landscape of child care in mm. the U.S. and what it looks like now, because my impression is, uh, you know, there there is some government support. Some families get subsidies. But for the most part, you're talking about a sort of network of primarily very small, independent child care centers and or people who are doing this work, uh, you know, for free for their families, if you have a family member who's maybe looking after your kid or a friend's kid or whatever. So talk to us about what it looks like currently. Well, right now, it's pretty clear that people are having a hard time finding the child care that they need outside of the home, and also that it's become uh, increasingly expensive 
to do it. And it's clearly uh, making life difficult for a lot of families and uh, having some adverse effects on children as well. I think it's particularly consequential for women who are const- often more constrained by childcare responsibilities than men are. And, um, you know, part of this has to do with just the nature of services that are different than, it's different than a producing a good, a physical good. Um, it, it, it's long been noted that uh, services are not as susceptible to technical change. Mm. The very nature of care means you got to have fa- some face-to-face, hands-on interaction. Maybe technology is going to improve the quality or change the nature of it. But it's it's basically a, a pretty labor-intensive and emotionally intensive uh, kind of uh, provision. Uh, it's one that uh, people uh, really value that's really important in terms of their quality of life and child outcomes, but it's um, not easy to put it together with a world in which most families have two, need two income earners, so they need some uh, help with childcare outside the home. Another thing I think is worth mentioning is that uh, it used to be that uh, parents could rely on a pretty large network of, of neighbors and kin to help them out with childcare. That's much less true than it used to be. Um, College-educated workers in particular are pretty unlikely now to live in the same area as their parents. Uh, A lot of job requirements mean that people have to be willing to move. Um, So, you know, there's just less available uh, kin nearby uh, compared to what what there used to be, especially in in large cities. Um, And... You know, the fact that more more women are working means that more more sort of potential grandmothers are also working uh, as well. So that's another constriction in the the kind of supply of of informal care. So that's one of the things that's that's driving the problem. So one of the things that's really striking, and you mentioned, uh, you know, particularly say in New York City, there's so many people face childcare stress. People are tearing their hairs out trying to uh, find. Uh, someone to watch their baby or a young child. And we see these charts of the prices going crazy. And the numbers that people have to pay are pretty astronomical. And yet my impression is that the actual wages of the people really? who work in daycare centers or child care centers are low. And so there is seems to be, you know, I know you're sort of the idea of a market failure is maybe perhaps not the best way of framing it. But this does feel very intuitively like how people think of a market failure. Why are the costs for the end consumer surging? At the same time, the workers do not seem to be reaping much of the benefit from it in terms of uh, uh, rapid wage gains. Well, I mean, one you know, one of the most basic market failures that often gets left out of the discussion of market failure is that people can't participate in a market unless they have enough money. Mm. Uh, so what's happened with childcare is as inequality has increased, the demand for childcare has gone up and the price of it has gone up. And what's happened is a lot of low income families have been just priced out of the market. So they're unable to buy it. So it's kind of like the housing market which tilted very much towards high-end housing and left us with a huge growing population of homeless people that can't afford housing because low-income housing is so hard to find. So I think that's uh, one of the factors that's, that's driving the problem. But another one in New York City in particular is that for a long time, the kind of safety valve was low wage immigrants who were willing to work under the table, uh, as nannies or as occasional babysitters or, or childcare, we don't have very good statistics on what's happened to that supply. But it's pretty clear that the combination of the pandemic and immigration policy and cultural change in the U.S. has kind of reduced that that informal supply that was once kind of helping lubricate the market. Um, but you know, another factor is that is that the way the labor market's supposed to work is that when there's a shortage of labor. Wages go up very rapidly, right. but w- it's really hard to raise wages in the child care industry for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of it at the lower end relies on government subsidies and government you know, regulated rates and also on funding. And so if the funding stream doesn't increase, those 
subsidized centers can't pay higher wages, right? So that's one kind of sticky point um, in in the whole you know, in, in the whole process. But then another one is the example that I was, you know, the, the point that I was making is that if you have enough money uh, and there's a lot of scarcity, you can, you can bid up the prices for kind of individual providers like nannies, right. Without really necessarily going through the daycare center wow. care uh, system. So it's not, you know, I guess maybe a way to think about it is it's not a homogeneous product. Uh, you know, it's coming from all these different sources. And um, so yeah, the market failure that you're referring to is kind of a function right. of, a, of a more complex institutional failure, I guess, uh, that's that's aggravating things. So I definitely want to talk about inequality inflation uh, or this idea that you have, you know, more price inelastic consumers who might be driving up prices for other people. But just before we do, in, in terms of this idea of Childcare is expensive, and you might have someone who's paying two or three thousand dollars a month in New York City or elsewhere. Where is that money going to if it's not going to the wages of the workers? And if, uh, you know, we were doing some prep on this before the episode, if profit margins for a lot of these childcare centers are relatively low, where does all that money go? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's always a good idea to follow the money, isn't it? Um, but I guess one of the uh, points I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, buying childcare services on the informal market, like like paying a nanny, probably those rates are going up a lot. Those aren't really part of the establishment, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics establishment survey. So what we're seeing with kind of low and stagnant wages is childcare centers, hmm. right, including some that are subsidized. Uh, through state and, and local funding, and and you know, and yet there's this you know there's this kind of a boutique market uh, where uh, people are really really paying super high prices, and that's not necessarily reflected in the aggregate statistics. So it so I mean, uh, and you're sort of you're just putting together what you're saying. Part of the problem is to even talk about this as a market is there's so many different markets. So you have some people who work as nannies and probably getting paid very well. You have a lot of people who are not getting paid any nominal wage because they're taking care of their child or they're taking care of their grandchild or something in the family. And then you have uh, uh, daycare or childcare workers. And so to even talk about this as like a market or to say, well, we know that the average wage of a childcare worker is X is a flaw right from the beginning because there are just so many different types of ways with which childcare is provisioned. Yeah, I think that's a really good summary. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to the inequality uh, aspect because I think I find that really interesting. And do we have any like sense of like the distribution or do uh, the distribution like how many uh, how many workers are moving from say working uh, might have been working at a daycare or childcare center and now working getting paid much more as a very rich family's nanny like. What what is the distribution there and that flow of workers look like, and how much does the sort of extreme wealth of some people and the ability to hire a nanny, or obviously in many cases, or at least some cases, multiple nannies, like how much does that, uh, in your view, uh, sort of affecting the industry overall? Well, first of all, it's a really interesting empirical question. To answer it, you need basically you need some administrative data that follows people longitudinally. Yeah. And there's often a lag in our access to that kind of uh, longitudinal data. Um, I recently worked on a study of human service workers in the city of Seattle, and we were able to get some administrative data showing that when people left human service jobs, including childcare for another job, they got a really big pay increase. But that was, um, you know, pre-pandemic and not really very up to date. But, um, you know, another way to think about it is uh, the the issue is that there's some selection bias. That is like when you see the what's happening to prices and wages, there's a lot you're, you know, you're not seeing the people that cannot afford to buy childcare anymore, right. right? So some people are paying a whole lot more for childcare, but some people can't buy it at all. So what you're seeing is, yes, the price is going up because poor people can no longer afford to buy it. 
So that's why I think the analogy to housing is kind mm. of is kind of helpful. Uh, you you can actually make you know affluent families are willing and able to pay a lot of a lot of money for childcare uh, and for other care services, right? But um, families at the bottom are not earning a wage that's sufficiently high to hire somebody uh, to help them with that work and still be able to pay their other bills. Mm. So it's really kind of about an, a, a selection bias in the, in the, in the market. Um, that's why I think the housing analogy, you know, kind of works. I mean, how could we, how can we have a shortage of housing in a country where we have actually pretty, pretty successful and efficient housing industry, but it's building homes for uh, the affluent because the profit margins higher there. Um, right. And both of these things, I mean, housing and child care would be considered essential services or things to have in order to live a full, normal economic life and human life. Um, but yeah. talk to us a little bit about how we got here. What are the choices that hmm. the U.S. specifically made in order to create a sort of um, private child care industry or, I guess, informal economy network? I, you know, I don't think there were explicit choices. I think it's kind of the chaotic result of a process of kind of collective bickering and negotiation over who should pay the costs of rearing the next generation. And um, that's why I think it's really important to think about the big picture, like who should pay those costs. And the economics profession uh, like the social sciences in general, has kind of treated, treated child rearing as though it's sort of a, you know, a luxury good. It's a consumption good. You know, having a child is like having a pet. It's your pet. You should take care of it. Uh, it's your business. And now we're beginning to realize that that's a terrible metaphor because raising children is actually a really important component of economic sustainability. The future labor force uh, the people who are going to pay the taxes that are going to support us in our old age. So I think it's sort of coming, you know, I think this is becoming, there's there's more realization about this, looking at kind of the future of Medicare and Social Security, the implications of a below replacement fertility rate. It's like, oh, gee, you know, it's going to be a problem if we don't have uh, a working age population that's big enough uh, to help us uh, meet our needs as we grow older. Can you talk through, uh, suppose uh, a, a family that cannot afford uh, child care, either a private nanny or even a sort of a, a more public option by public, I mean, or a sort of commercially available option at like a child care or daycare center. What happens? I assume the burden of that in many families, uh, you know, overwhelmingly falls on uh, the mother. But what is the sort of uh, the cost of that in terms of, okay, you have uh, one mother who is able to find child care, another mother who can't find it or can't afford it in terms of what did the cost to them in terms of their life, in terms of earnings and so forth from that unequal distribution of available child care? Well, I mean, it, it, first, one big manifestation of it is resorting to part time or temporary work, you know, cycling in and out of the labor force. Like uh, maybe you have an informal child care arrangement cobbed together with a working schedule and then your child gets sick. What do you, what do you do? You figure out a way, you, you know, you basically have to quit your job. You might hope that you get unemployment insurance. Um, then you have to kind of rely on friends and family. And then you go out and try and find another job where you can, uh, actually combine that with responsibilities for, for looking after your kids, or you look for neighbors or kin who are willing to trade or, or, uh, exchange services for that. That's kind of a stressful and time consuming process. And, uh, you know, it has pretty significant consequences for lifetime earnings because anybody in the labor market who doesn't have a sort of consistent record of full time, uh, job tenure, um, uh, it gets stuck at the bottom and is not a real candidate for moving up the occupational ladder. So I think it, it really contributes a lot to the, you know, kind of a, serious lack of, of uh, income mobility um, for mothers. I mean, the paradox is that uh, th there's a lot of evidence that high earning mothers actually pay a bigger quote unquote cost for motherhood because when they take time out from 
uh, their careers, the penalty is very high because mm -hmm. their earnings are very high. So they're taking a bigger hit in terms of earnings, but almost all of those women are also married to high earners. That, and that provides a kind of buffer or safety net that, that reduces the impact of the motherhood penalty. Whereas women who are stuck in very um, part-time kind of secondary labor market jobs are, 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 are basically stuck there for life. Uh, without much opportunity to, you know, once their kids grow up and leave home, they w could look for a better job, but they have no employment, you know, their employment history and their employment record kind of condemns, condemns them to a pretty low trajectory. So just on this note, you know, Joe and I started the conversation talking about the supply chain disruptions that we saw during the pandemic. And of sure. course, the pandemic was also extremely disruptive for the childcare industry and for anyone who had, you yeah. know, younger children um, and suddenly had to figure out what to do with them um, while they were perhaps working from home and things like that. Talk to us about what the pandemic showed mm. about this sort of economic trajectory, because I remember there's been a lot of high profile research saying, for instance, that the gender wage gap went up during the pandemic because a lot of women had to reduce their hours in order to look after their children and things like that. Yeah, what we know from, from time use research is that women increased their um, hours of childcare and, and housework uh, significantly. I mean, men did too, uh, partly because of, of working, of be, you know, being at home more, right? But women's, the increase in women's workload was clearly bigger uh, than that of men. I, I think there's another finding from, um, from time use research. Uh, you know, most, of, most time use research is based on the American Time Use Survey, which is uh, a really interesting representative sample of the U.S. population that just asks people, you know, what did you do? when you woke up, what did you do after that? What did, you know, what did you do then? What did you do after? So it gives us a real sense of how much unpaid work is, was being performed both before and, and after the pandemic. And the survey asked the question, a bunch of questions about active childcare, like how much time did you spend? Well, it, it, it's not asking these questions directly, but it's taking the responses that people give to the survey and then it's coding them into categories. Like, Here's the time that people re reported feeding their children. Here's the time that people reported, on average, transporting their children. Hmm. Here's the time that parents reported, on average, reading aloud to their children. And uh, those active childcare responsibilities are pretty, um, they're pretty binding, uh, but they're not really great that they're not really that high in terms of hours average hours per day, what's really much greater for a much greater temporal demand for parents of young children is what's called supervisory time or in your care time. The fact that somebody has to be home mm. and available or on call um, with children. And so it, this, this really, this difference really explains a lot. For instance, when parents utilize paid childcare services, they're not really reducing their active childcare that much. They're, they're coming home from work and they're engaging with their kids. They're getting their kids ready to go to school in the morning. There's still a lot of active care. What childcare really reduces, out of home childcare really does for parents is it reduces supervisory constraints. Okay, it li it's literally against the law in most states to leave a child under the age of nine or even under the age of 12 uh, alone in a house. Hmm. Um, so during the pandemic, here's what's interesting. A lot of people were working at home. What the time use survey shows is that supervisory time went way up. Active childcare actually went down. Huh. Huh. Why is that? Well, I think it's because uh, there's kind of a quantity quality trade-off. Mm. And if you spend all of your day with kids around and being available or on call, right? A lot of little small interruptions and a lot of, you know, interactions, right? Maybe you feel less, less need to dedicate two hours to them in the evening, reading aloud or playing games or something like that. It's sort of like childcare kind of spreads out um, into more diffuse uh, activities, then, you know, when they're working parents, 
um, the schedule is kind of like this huge bustle in the morning to get the kids off. And then this pressure to pick them up after school, which is pretty, a pretty big temporal demand on working parents' schedules. But then in the evenings, there's this very concentrated peak of time you feeding the child, bathing the child, reading aloud to the child. It's sort of like making up for not having seen the child during the day. There's this very concerted cultivation that takes place. Definitely uh, relate to everything you just said there. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as uh, I have uh, two young kids and also the part about if you spend all day, maybe you're like, all right, do I really want to read tonight? Anyway, um, moving, <laughs> yeah, but, cool. but moving on that, uh, I'm curious. We should interview you. <laughs> now, I, I'm curious, um, though, uh, the value of unpaid child care. And, and I, I'm, I'm curious, like, A, how do you go about trying to put a number on that? And B, like, how useful in terms of your analytical framework uh, is is trying to put some sort of dollar amount on how much of that exists in the economy. Yeah, I think it's really important um, because it kind of reveals the significance of the care sector of the economy as a whole. And it's pretty, I mean, the methods that uh, are typically used are pretty simple, just taking reports of the number of hours spent in the activity and multiplying them times a re replacement wage cost, like what you would pay to hire someone to do that work. But um Obviously, there are a lot of decisions to make about how to define the time and, and what replacement wage uh, to choose for that calculation. But, uh, you know, what you get is not really an accurate estimate, but it's a kind of a lower bound estimate. It's sort of saying at the very least, if parents withdrew their services and we had to pay somebody to take their place, what would we have to pay? So I think it's really careful. I mean, I think it's really important not to suggest that it's you know, you're capturing the value of parenting. No, no, no. You're just, you're capturing some kind of counterfactual question about what it would cost to, to uh, replace uh, the time that parents provide. And it just gives, well, one thing that it shows, I think, is that really the market economy is a pretty, pretty, you know, big, but, but not that huge chunk of the total economy. So what do we talk about in terms of numbers or like a sort of like, what, what does it look like? Well, a lot of the estimates are kind of all over the place because they're using different wage rates and different definitions of time. But they it's kind of from between 25% and 40% of GDP is what wow. a measurement of unpaid work uh, comes to. And um in my work, I mean, I've actually spent a lot of time working with the American Time Use Survey on exactly this question. And what I found is that a lot of estimates only counted ac active childcare, and they basically ignored mm. time that children were reported as being in my care or the supervisory constraints. Mm. And if you include, I mean, and which doesn't make sense, that's what do you hire a babysitter for? Right. You don't hire a babysitter to, you know, um, provide developmental care and they're right. usually sitting there watching TV while or, or playing the video games while they're supervising kids. So if you include that supervisory time, it really incre increases the total value of, of unpaid work. Um, or here's a really interesting, just to step, uh, step back from childcare a minute and just ask the question of all of the hours that people spend doing work in the United States today, how much of that happens in the labor market? How much of it is paid? Mm. And here for this, for this little uh, mental exercise, we're just going to say we're going to define work as anything you could pay somebody else to do for you. Okay. So it doesn't include leisure. You can't pay somebody to have a good time for you. It, <laughs> it doesn't include sleep. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't include bathing. Um, or a cooking, lot of personal care cleaning, activities. Cooking, cleaning, gardening, it's things cooking, like that. It's cleaning, it's gardening, it's managing, it's shopping, right? It's 50% of all labor hours in the U.S. Wow. Um, so 50%. So just on this note, you know, you made the point earlier that having children is important uh, for both the economy and humanity, I believe, uh, for a while. 
The children are our future. Isn't that what future. they said? Yes. So sing it. you're supposed to sing it. <laughs> so yeah, right. um, I, I won't subject um, all of our listeners to me <laughs> singing. Um, but just on that note, who should bear yeah. the cost of child care? I mean, this seems to be the ultimate question. Yes, it is. It is the ultimate question. And it's so seldom that anyone ever asks it outright. Uh, so I'm really glad. And I wish I could give you like a really specific answer, <laughs> but I think it's sort of a, a matter of kind of democratic deliberation. I mean, certainly parents should pay a very significant share of the cost of raising children because they're deriving a lot of satisfaction and, and enjoyments and a lot of, I think, improvement in their own kind of capabilities as a result of, of being a parent, right? But, um, it's also true that fellow citizens and taxpayers and and benefits recipients are also getting some really important benefits from kids. And there are some really interesting efforts to look at this, what's called a fiscal externality, you know, like, okay, you're raising a child, we can project what that child is going to pay in taxes over their lifetime. And then we could subtract what we think that child is going to get in benefits over, over their lifetime. Right. And that net fiscal benefit in the U.S. is pretty high. So, so Joe, if you're a parent, you're, you're creating probably a, a fiscal, a fiscal externality that in, in the sense that your, your child is going to grow up to pay more in taxes than they get in benefits. S setting aside parents versus non parents, or uh, what about, you know, like, how much of the answer is, to put crudely, setting aside the specific design, higher taxes yeah. on the rich to fund the provision of public child care for everyone else, especially when talking about the fact that there's a num more and more people who are priced out of child care overwhelmingly. And you obviously yeah. have a growing but small percentage of the people that can afford one or multiple nannies. How much of that is a simple on some level choice of like progressive taxation, either through income or the consumption of child care services to fund it uh, on a more broad scale basis? Oh, I, I think that's, you know, a very clear strategy. And it's one that I completely support and arguing for more, uh, basically more public provision of care services and more support for unpaid care uh, by increasing uh, progressive taxes. And, you know, I think that was kind of the motivating uh, force behind the Build Back Better legislation that was the Democrats proposed in the fall. And, and I think we can push for that without, you know, having a specific estimate. But there's also this kind of interesting, I think, philosophical question, which is, well, just how much should uh, the cost of raising children be socialized? Mm. We've already socialized them to some extent. The problem is we've, we've socialized the benefits of raising children more than we've socialized the costs. Mm. Okay, so the social security system and Medicare has socialized the benefits so your children aren't going to support you in your old age, but the younger generation as a whole is going to do that, right? So it has literally created a redistribution from parents to non-parents. And by non-parents, I don't mean, you know, biologically non-parents. I'm defining parents as people who devote a lot of money and time and effort to raising kids. They're, you know, they're creating a public, you know, a fiscal externality. And I think that that provides a kind of, um, I think, an additional argument uh, for more public support for parenting. Right. Um, just on this notion, I mean, my my impression of the existing system is that there are subsidies for low income families for some child care services, but there aren't a lot. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there are a lot of government run child care centers. And I'm wondering, like, what form should government support for child care mm. services actually come in? Because, again, in America, I can imagine, you know, if you put a proposal on the table saying we're going to have government daycare centers, I feel like it, it, there is there is a portion of the population who would instinctively um, find that dystopian or sinister in some way. And if I could just tack on to that question, 
why why is it that in from your view we've sort of accepted this idea of like we do have government child care basically starting at the age five and so exactly. it's like once you hit kindergarten or whatever like there is public school that goes through the end of high school which yes of course there is an educational component but every parent knows a big part of the value is that uh that child care services so just to tack on why would it be so controversial to say okay we're going to have the equivalent of public school from birth or from three months or whatever well i i mean i think that's a question kind of about the political and cultural climate and the divisions that have emerged you know partly as a result of the very transcendent inequality that 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 we started out kind of emphasizing. Um, but um, I think it's pretty clear from international comparisons that integrating childcare into the public school system is a really good idea. Hmm. And if we think that the public school system is too inflexible or, or not responsive to the needs of parents, we should, that should be part of our process of changing the whole thing. I mean, one of the thing, one issue that often gets left out in this discussion is that, you know, ending the, the, the public school day at three o'clock yeah. uh, in the afternoon is a tremendous inefficiency and an anachronism as are long summer vacations. And so I think what we should be pushing for is kind of a bigger rethink of public education and childcare that um, is more kind of in keeping with the technological and economic changes that have occurred over the last 50 years. Or, hear me out, we reduce working hours to match school times. Yes, that should be part of it And as we all well. have summer Absolutely. vacation. I prefer that solution. Yeah, uh, yeah well, the, the two <laughs> we go together. Take, we just take off all... I, yeah, I like the idea of everyone just yeah. getting it. I grew up with... Both of my parents were teachers, so it was like they had summer vacation. But yeah, I like yeah. this idea. It is crazy, too, that like this major child care service that the government provides, like, oh, we're just going to take four months off. Parents, good luck. Deal with it. <laughs> Find a camp if you can afford it. It really is crazy. And, it, you know, yeah, children need time off, but why, why not give them time off in a different way than, you know, three and a half uninterrupted uh, months? Um, so I think there's a lot of scope for thinking about that. And I, I, I totally agree with um, Tracy's point about reducing the paperwork, making it easier uh, to for people to uh, uh, choose a, a lower lower working hours, and, and here again, this is why I think emphasizing the value of unpaid work helps that argument because you're not when you reduce pressure for increased hours of employment, people aren't using that time to goof off or couch surf. They're a lot of times they're using that time to. Uh, take care of their family, to take care of their communities, to volunteer and, you know, and really for really good activities. And so sort of this notion that any reduction in hours of employment is a kind of quote unquote loss of mm. output is just camouflage. Can I ask you, you mentioned international comparisons about uh, merging the sort of childcare or daycare system with the public school. Who stands out to you when you look around the world? Where is it being done right or where is it being done more equitably? Well, this Scandinavian countries have have a very integrated system, but the French system is also very appealing um, because it includes not just uh, a system where preschool teachers earn the same as as regular teachers mm -hmm. and universal. It also includes all these things like summer camp experiences are built into the school system and um, Medical care and, and health checkups are kind of integrated with the school system, so it's um, it's kind of a, tri a a particular triumph of of the French system. But but you know, there's also a lot to learn from what's happened in New York City with De Blasio's expansion of childcare, uh, which has has raised a lot of interesting uh, uh, questions and points, and it's like a really valuable lesson for for the rest of the country. I'm not an expert on the particular features of it, but uh, I know that it's contributed significantly to increasing the wages of childcare workers mm. in the city, and that there's been sort of it's been easier for them because it's now a city mandated. You know, it's now part of the public sector. Uh, in a sense, it's made it easier for those daycare workers to bargain uh, for higher wages. Interesting. Mm. So just going back to the premise of this conversation and, and the intro where we were talking about, you know, in, 
inflation in services versus inflation in consumer goods and things like that and wages as well. What do you think childcare says about the overall direction of the economy? Or can you sort of draw out some big picture um, economic points based on the childcare example? Well, I think we should direct more attention to what I would call the care sector, not just childcare, but see what child care and elder care and health care all have in common and how important they are to the economy. And all three of those sectors involve collaboration between family members and paid workers, for-profit businesses and government. And they've all evolved in this very ad hoc way uh, that often kind of you know, rigidifies into kind of institutional inertia that makes them very difficult to change. But uh, one of the things that's been happening, for instance, in the in the healthcare industry, is that hospitals and doctors have begun paying a lot more attention to who the at home caregiver is, and when they send somebody home from the hospital, who is the person who's going to be helping with medication? Who is the person who's going to be organizing uh, the you know, uh, post-operative care and so forth. And they have have really realized that this is a crucial part of, of the overall landscape of care provision that, you know, you can, you can do a really great surgery on somebody. And if they go home to a situation where there's nobody there to be uh, helping them figure out uh, how to take care of themselves and to kind of meet their needs, then they're back in the hospital the next day. So, it just there's so many different synergies, right? Uh, and there's so little, relatively little attention to the care sector and what it, what it means. You know, we know that there are these um, really significant changes in mortality in the U.S. The so-called deaths of despair, deaths from suicide, deaths from drug overdose, deaths from alcoholism, and it's such a it's so indicative of a kind of toxic, some kind of toxic effects of something that's going on in the economy. And, you know, it's very consequential. It's not just a huge loss of human life. It's also, you know, just a, a tremendous loss to families and communities to have this kind of, I think I would describe it as a destruction of the social climate. There's something about the social climate that's just, uh, creating a lot of uh, uh, stress and mental illness. And I think care provision, you know, ineffective care provision is part of that. Hmm. Um, you know, part of it is that families are less stable. Part of it is that families get less support. Part of it is that people are just very much isolated and, and you know, disembedded from their families and communities. And it's so... It's so important to see that as an economic as well as a social problem. Well, uh, Nancy Fulbright, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Fascinating discussion, huge topic that I'm sure we will revisit. And yeah, uh, yeah appreciate you uh, joining us. Yeah, it was fun to talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. That was great. Uh, Tracy, I thought there were a number of really interesting themes from that. I mean, one is, I think, just simply this idea of like how hard it is even to talk about like a child care market or a mm. child care wage or a price that people pay for child care, just given the plethora of different uh, options available, whether it's nannies, public centers, private centers, you know, subsidized centers, family work, et cetera, just like even just dis d describing what the industry is is clearly a challenge. Totally. And I feel like we actually need to speak to a preschool yeah. manager or something because I'm still confused. I met one recently. So oh, really? Yeah, I think well, we have a guest. I'm still confused about where the yeah. money is going. You know, people are paying thousands a month. Um, where is that actually going, if not to the wages of the carers? I suspect it's going on things like uh, rent and maybe yeah. like regulations and yeah. things like that. But I would love to talk more about it. And then the other thing that stood out to me was this idea of inflation inequality, which mm -hmm. is something that's been coming up a lot recently. I think the New York Times called it the gentrification of the economy. Mm. So this idea that, you know, businesses are increasingly catering to, as yes. the wealth gap gets bigger, a portion of the population 
that is more price inelastic and that can afford these services. And that kind of gets to Nancy's point as well about how we're only really seeing part of the data set, right? Yeah. Because people who cannot afford these prices are just not paying for childcare. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we and again, we, the, the, uh, Nancy brought up the comparison, but the comparison to housing seems really apt. Mm. And we've done episodes, it's like no one wants to build a, quote, starter home, unquote, because there's just so much more money to build premium houses, uh, to build, uh, you know, premium multifamily uh, uh uh, apartments and so things like that and so you know one of the things is that it sort of drives home like inequality is costly it's costly for society and you know people like i think you know in our system we sort of celebrate getting rich etc and pro- you know that seems fine but like there is a cost to having so much concentration of wealth in certain hands such that uh, it you know can diminish the pool of available child care which then gets to nancy's other key point which is like Part of the reason it's not a market is because there is like a social positive externality towards like raising children that like any everyone benefits from. I think she called it a fiscal surplus. Was fiscal that? externality. Fiscal externality that is like just sort of not there in most things that we call like a market. Mm. Um, the other thing I, I wish we'd been able to talk a little bit more about, but the choices that go into the yeah. current system. And I totally take Nancy's point that probably there wasn't anyone, you know, right. thinking about this specifically over the course of 50 years and coming up with a coordinated, holistic approach. But I do also think one of the reasons we got to the current system is because of, uh, let's say, complicated attitudes towards women actually yes. working, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. Yeah, there's so much. And just even this question of like, well, what is what counts as labor, which I thought mm. was an interesting uh, a sort of discussion that I hadn't really thought of in terms of like, okay, there are things that we call like active child care as parents and then there are things that's like are you just there to like sort of supervise them um pretty like deep questions that are sort of intensely cultural that sort of perhaps inform like how these uh how the how the system evolved in the way it did absolutely shall we leave it there let's leave it there all right this has been another episode of the odd lots podcast i'm tracy alloway you can follow me on twitter at tracy alloway and i'm joe weisenthal you can follow me on twitter at the stalwart follow our guest nancy fulbray she's at n fulbray follow our producers carmen rodriguez at carmen Armin and dashiell bennett at dashbot and check out all of our podcasts at bloomberg under the handle at podcasts and for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts, we have a blog, and a newsletter, and you can even uh, check out our Discord, where we uh, chat 24-7, listeners hanging out, go to Discord.gg slash Odd Lots, really uh, fun conversations there. Thanks for listening.